uh, and we're going to <coughs> look at verse 10. Um, first of all, we want to thank God and give God, as always, all the honor and the glory, because certainly God uh, not only deserves it, but it belongs to him. Uh, as we continue our study in the book of James, we have one chapter left. Uh, we're still, uh, well, we're going to finish up, but move on to the next segment because uh, James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10, again, talks about desires and divisions. And we, we pretty much covered uh, that uh, in the next segment that we're going to be looking into into the scripture starting from verse uh, 10, but actually we're going to look at verse 11, and we're going to look from verses 11 and 12, uh, and we'll probably go further because James talks about speaking evil and judging. In verse 10, uh, and you can follow along with me either by Bible or uh, by the projection, but here James talks about he says, um, think about yourselves. And I'm reading from the Easy English Version. Think about yourselves as small in front of the Lord God. Then he will make you great. In reference to there, the Bible tells us we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. In other words, often tell people never uh, compare yourself to someone else. The greatest person we could compare ourselves to because it's so easy to compare ourselves to someone that is less fortunate than us or someone, uh, you take a sinner, compare yourself. It's like the Pharisee did with the sinner when they were in the, uh, the publican did with the sinner when they was in the temple. It's so easy to do that. When you do something like that, you will never elevate to growth uh, spiritually. But when you uh, compare yourself to God's word or Christ himself. It lets us know our shortcoming and it gives us something to aim to. In Job 22 and 29, Job said you will pray for people who have difficulties and when you pray, God will make their lives better. That's what we should always do. Instead of talking about the people with difficulties, we are destined by God to pray for them. And the only people who don't pray for people are people who have no relationship with God. Your relationship is not predicated on how much you come to God's house, how much you attend church, how much you sing in the choir, whether you're a deacon, preacher, blah, 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 blah. It is predicated on you believing and trusting God. Because God say, if you come to me, the first thing you have to do is believe that I am God. And I am a rewarder of them that diligently seek me. Then here's another point the scripture says, is that when we pray and we believe that God hears us when we pray, then we ought to believe that he answers us. So Job said that we have to pray for, for people. In Proverbs 29 and 23, people will not always like a man that is proud. They would not think that he is great, but they will like a man that is not proud. They would think that he is great. In other words, we should not hold our nose up to people. We shouldn't look down on people. Everybody don't drive the same cars. Every, everyone don't live uh, in the suburbs. Everyone is not fortunate to wear nice clothes or expensive clothes. All clothes are nice, expensive clothes. So we should not look down on no one because in the eyesight of God, we're all equal. And one thing that makes this plan feel so equal is that when we all die, we can take none of that stuff with us. None of it. So in verse 11, he say, my Christian brothers, let me go from the King James Version uh, along with you all. He says, first of all, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. God is the one that lifts us up. That's why I often tell people, don't put me on a pedestal, don't lift me up. Uh, most people enjoy being lifted up. People will get mad if you don't give them a pat on the back. That's the worst thing you can do because the Bible says you already got your reward. But you have to humble yourself. Let me reflect back to Sunday's sermon because it was so much 
in that that relates to what James is talking about is that I didn't get a chance to cover it all because when the woman took her tears and washed Jesus' feet and took her hair and dried them, it was a sign of humility, a sign of humbleness. And this is where God wants us to be. One thing, uh, one of my pet peeves is, is looking at a believer that is snobbish. That think that they just have the world. And, 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 and let me tell you something, because there was a time in my life when I first got saved, I couldn't stand myself. Once I found out the truth, because again, I told y'all, I, in the beginning, I, I wasn't taught. You know, I wasn't taught to live like a Christian. I wasn't taught to think like Jesus. Because you all know how it was back in the day. They give a good scripture, and I'm not faulting them because it brought us to this point in our life. They will give a good scripture, a good title, and say a few words, and we, we wait, and we like little birds. I'm waiting for it now. Bring me the gravy. And when the piano, at the time it was a piano, when the piano cranked up and the preaching started, we felt good. It just did something to us because we felt good, but we had no change. So the thing about it is that I was one of those when I first got saved and started preaching, man, I would look down. I was like that, that publican. I was everything James was saying not to do. I would look at a sinner and say, look at them. They just, ah, uh, they just, they just need to die off somewhere. They just filthy, they just nasty, you know. I mean, that's what's my mindset because I felt at that moment uh, is that, how many of you know, is that one guy says that uh, when something goes on, you're going to get part of the truth because there's more than one side to every story, but you'll find the truth somewhere in the middle. So my side of the story had some truth to it. By the way I was feeling, I was feeling good that I was saved. But then the bad part about it, I was judging people that wasn't saved. Oh, don't let me see. And I came out of the world, hadn't been out of the world that long, you know, but I didn't understand this because I wasn't taught. So then the Spirit of God revealed to me and he said, look, wait a minute. This is not why I chose you. This is not why I sent my son. According to John 3, 15, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son, verse 16, into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So I went through all of that, and, and God said, you're no better than those people. I didn't choose you to condemn them. I chose you so that you will be a beacon light through love that they too will accept me. So and say, in all of your righteousness is only but filthy rags. So that humbled me to realize, started thinking, what if God take his Holy Spirit from me? Where would I be? What would I be? The same. So it, it transformed my way of thinking to realize that we're all under the grace of God. Actually, when people look at the scripture, he tells you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It had nothing to do with Christians because it's not just Christians in the world, but he say he so loved the world. That means every human being. And he said that I didn't send my son. He said I didn't send my son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And he said don't have to condemn because if they don't believe that I sent my son to save them, to die for them, and, and empowered him to rise again, then they are already condemned. So it changed my way of thinking. And I told you all the story about when I met Elder Kenneth. You know, God had brought me a long ways. So James is saying in verse 10, he said, you have to humble yourself. Humbleness, humility means not just being quiet. No, it means that how low are you willing to let life go? Like Jesus, he washed the feet of his disciples. See, the greatest person in the kingdom is not the most educated person. 
It's not the person with three, four, five houses. Those are materialistic things. God can care less about materialistic things. If we want to know how God feels about materialistic things, I'm glad you do. I'll tell you. He say the earth, heaven and earth is going to pass away. Everything in it. Everything will be brand new. He even told us that, you know, that, that this stuff we see now is, is nothing. So he said you have to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, not men, but Lord. We act some kind of way. And when I say we, I'm not necessarily talking about nobody here. I'm talking about the church. When I'm speaking, I'm speaking about the church. There is no division in the church. There are many members, but one body. I'm talking about in the body of Christ because whatever you do here is going to reflect the body of Christ. Whatever you do out there in them streets, if you don't believe me, some of you probably experience it. If they see you drunk, the first thing they're going to say, look at there. And he's supposed to be a deacon. He's supposed to be a preacher. Oh, he's supposed to be a Christian. Oh, ain't that the choir member? Ain't that the praise worship singer? See, I told y'all, watch this. They're not going to say, I told y'all don't go to that heart of faith church. No, they're going to say these words. I told y'all, that's why I don't fool with church folk. They just as fake as they want to be. So they label everybody the same. So he said, you have to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You're never lifted up unless God lift you up. Speak, in verse 11, he says, speak not evil. Y'all see that? And this is what he's talking about, speaking evil and judging. Speak not evil one another. Brethren, he that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Verse 12, there is one law giver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? I love those words there. Who are you to judge another? One, one, one uh, uh, um, interpretation say, who are you to judge another man's servant? Romans 14 and 4 says, who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So we're all servants of God. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is he that become a servant unto his brother. So what we have to understand is that we can judge people. We can talk about people. We can call them stupid. We can do everything we can. But have we ever wondered why that person is still standing? It's right here in the scriptures. He said, who are you to judge another man's servant? Whether if he fallen or standing, God is able to cause him to stand, to uplift him. And that's why I often tell you all, you waste too much of your energy and your time. Some of you probably would have been millionaires by now. But what hindered you was, you worried about what people said about you. Some of you would have been further in life than you are now. But you will always worry about what somebody thought about you. And let me tell you something what, what, what we all should know. You can never do good to satisfy men. Just look at your children. When you feed them and you know we were like that. God knows you fed them. My mama used to tell us that. Whip us, boy. She'll feed us and take us. We go visit. And first thing we get there, food is that we, can I have some chips? Can I have some cookies? And then you get a whoop and say, you act like I didn't feed you. Wow, wow. You can feed your children, and it seems like they'll never get through eating. Ten minutes later, 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, they looking on the shelf, can I have some more cookies? You just ate five, can I have another one? And you wondering where the food going. So James says, speak not evil one another. What is, what is he saying? My Christian brothers and sisters, do not say bad things about one another. If you speak against another man, you're judging him or her. When you do this, you speak against the law and you judge it as well. If you judge the law, you do not obey it. You have made your, it's a, a judge. Now in verse 11 in the church, there were those who said bad things about other Christians. Sounds familiar, don't it? In the body of Christ, the same thing. What they said was unkind. And perhaps it was not true. 
And they must stop, James said, they must stop doing it because they are brothers and sisters. To speak against a Christian is against the law to love him or love her because Jesus said, look, I give you this law that is, is equivalent to the first but greater, that ye love one another. Look at somebody and say, do you love me? Go and answer them and say, yes, I do. But tell them, but why are you talking about me? Ask them that. Say, if you love me, why are you talking about me? So that's what James said. You work against the law of love. Because that's what the Bible say. It's the law of love. So when you talk about me, then you are judging the law of love. See, now, it's a difference talking about someone rather than correcting someone. Okay? Y'all understand that. Because we don't want to get to the lawlessness part We have to say, see, there you go. Bishop Ain said, the Bible say, you judging me, you talking about me. No, it, it's, you have to have correction. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't play like y'all done got saved, sanctified, and your memory gone. You know how you get on them phones and you talk, girl, you heard what they said. And you know what? I don't think it's true. I, I believe it is. Yeah, I believe it is. You can tell how she was looking at him. And we just do a whole story. You could tell. Remember when, when he came towards her? I'm like, they supposed to have their mind on Jesus. And dear girl, did you know when did that happen? Girl, right doing. Remember when he said, go and greet somebody? And he was walking right before her. And she rolled her eyes and turned to where I told you it was something wrong. Girl, I know what it is. I mean, we do that, Claudia, they do that, we do that. Yeah, as believers, we do that. We, we'll get the whole story, Jane say no. Tell somebody, say no, don't do that. We'll talk, we'll talk. Poor man, wife just died. He end up a month later married. <laughs> I told they been doing that. Oh, they were probably together before she died. Ain't nobody gonna meet somebody and marry somebody that quick. That's I mean that this is what Jay, this stuff goes on. Y'all know it go on. I ain't gonna go deep. I ain't gonna go deep. I ain't gonna go deep. But brother Lacey, can I talk to you for a moment? They, they, they know they do stuff like that. They probably, some of them in here probably did that. I don't know. I don't know if y'all if y'all have. Y'all touch somebody and say, stop it. Stop it. Her dead now, so he free to marry. Don't matter what happened in Pat, they could marry. So James said we need to stop that. We inflict this pain on ourselves. If we learn to love each other right where they're at, that's what God does. Love us right where we are at. So, so, so here he says that they cannot speak evil about other Christians and at the same time love them. See, we have loose lips that we said. Well, watch this, watch this. Everybody say, I love, I love you. See, we got loose lips. We just say that so loosely, I love you. We just throw it out there. Tell somebody, look, at, and the preacher's got a bad. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I love you. And we just look and say, I love you. We so loose with those, but you have to understand what love is about. You cannot speak evil about other Christians and at the same time love them. They don't match together. The person who speaks bad things about other people acts as a judge of that person. And those who do this also speak against the law of God. It as if they say that the law is not right. It is as if they have put it aside. They have become judges of the law. Their own ideals are to them more important than the law of God. But our duty is not to judge the law, but to obey it. And to obey the law, he says, love ye one another. Why? Love covers the multitude of sin. Well, I don't understand that, Bishop. Jesus said it when they say, how often shall I forgive my brother when he's sinned against me? Jesus says, 70 times 7. 
In other words, it's, it's, it's quite rare. Something got to be really disturbingly wrong if someone violate you 490 times in a day. And he didn't really say how long. He just said 70 times, uh, uh, seven, 490 times. But in other words, what he's saying is it's unlimited because God has no number of his grace that he placed on us. God is a, a forgiving God. That's why the scripture says, if you don't forgive your brother, then God is not going to forgive you. Sometimes I will hinder, and if you want to know how powerful what James is talking about here, I'll show you how powerful it is. The scripture says, if you have an art with your brother, you go and make peace with him. The first thing you do, you bring your offering and you lay it at the altar. You go back and make peace. Then you come and present. So we're not giving an offering. Most, most, I, I, well, let me, let me refresh that. Most of us is doing it wrong. We're just giving. And we don't know who or what we're giving to. Because, you, look, look, you give praise to God, but God say when you come before him, you present your offering. See? And, and the same way as your bodies, you present your body. Now what? It's in the, in the spiritual part of it. How's your, you know, you can be mad. Somebody that made you mad, your brother that made you mad. Another Christian that made you mad and you angry and you, you done told them off and probably done cussed them out and all that. Then offering time come, you just come and just drop your money in the offering and say, oh, God loves a cheer forgiver. Well, he don't love you because you didn't give out of love. You have a, he said, no, you sit it there and you go make peace with your brother. Then you come back and present it to me. That can hinder God's blessing in your life by how what you present to God. So it is as if they have put it aside, they have become judges. Their own ideals to them are more important than the law of God, but our duty is not to judge the law, but to obey it. Those who judge the law set themselves above the law. And this is talking, this is rather taking the place of God who is the judge. Only God can be the judge because he alone is not under the law. And then in verse 12, he talks about there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy and who is able to judge us all. No human being has the right to judge another one. Now you say, well, pastor, what about the judges on the bench? You have to understand the Bible had judges. We're not talking about, okay, they went to school. They, they hear the facts and they have the jury and everything. No, God is talking about we as believers who judge each other. And you know how sometimes we judge? We don't even have facts. We merely just have what somebody said. And, and, and watch this here. First thing you say, what did you say, Tiffany? Were you there? No, well, how did you know? I heard. Who did you hear from? Shan told me. Well, Shan, uh, well, tell me what did you see? Tiffany said so you told her. Well, I ain't see nothing. Uh, Kathy told me. <laughs> then you go to Kathy. Well, Kathy, yeah. Tiffany told Shan, and Shan said, you, what did you see? Well, how did you know this? I don't know. I just heard... Dolores and Janice talking. And I really shouldn't have been in a conversation, but I overheard them talking. So now I go to both of them. Well, she says, she heard y'all talking. Where y'all get it from? We don't know. We heard Michelle talking to her husband about it. Well, I go to them and they say, man, I don't know. I just heard some guys talking about it. Nobody was there. See, yeah, everybody wrong. Just going by what you heard, and probably what you heard, and most of it was a lie. And then when you start, with, and then when, when, so Brother Ike say, well, I'm just going to tell you like this here. Deacon Stanley told me, go to Deacon Stanley, he's going to say, no, nah, he's lying on me. I ain't tell him nothing. I ain't tell him that. That ain't what I told him. Then you come all the way back, everybody done added something. So I, that's why God is the only one. So that's why we need to be careful. No man can put aside the law of God. It is for all people and for all time. God would judge all people by the law that he gave. 
and the authority to judge belongs to God alone. God is the Lord of life and death. And, and this is why even when a crime happened, investigators, when they go and investigate, they hear statements, but out of their statements, they're trying to get what? What is they trying to get? No, not, 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 not evidence, because if you get evidence, you done got what everybody said. They want the truth, but come on, y'all. Y'all don't watch these movies. I love watching. Lady Baines, you ought to know because you be watching them too. They looking for one thing. No, we, uh, she said it, but they use another legal term. A uh, eye witness. That means ain't nobody told me nothing. I saw it. I was right there. That's what they looking for, eye witness. Because everything else is just he say. He say, she say, hearsay. You take the he and the she, put it together in my, where I come from, you get it out of the bondage, you'll get hearsay. But to get hearsay, you got to get the he and the she. He said, she said, put it together, hearsay. But they want the eyewitness. Even in Jesus' day, the woman that was caught in adultery, they chased her. And they took their rocks and they said, Lord, we caught her. In the very act, that means they were peeping tongues. I walked in on it. And they say, it is written that we stoned her to death. Now, it was true. But Jesus wrote on the ground, he that without sin, let him cast the first stone. They dropped everything. Because let they realized that we all have sin. And to this day, God don't speak. It's a silent subject. So I don't question it. But in my little finite mind, I wonder... What happened to the man? Did they kill him or did they let him go? Or was he part of one of that? I don't know what it was, and I, it ain't my business. The only point of it is, out of this logic, we see grace. So the authority to judge belongs to God alone. God is the Lord of life and death. And he alone is able to save life or to destroy it. He has the power to reward people or to punish them. So if we compare, compare with the power of God, man is so weak. So it is foolish for a man or a woman to judge a neighbor because we don't have the right. It makes no difference. It makes no difference. You know, and that's what we have to understand because this is where the devil destroys us at with the lack of information, with the lack of knowledge, because the Bible say, God say, look, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Knowledge is power. We perish because we don't have knowledge. And sometimes we think we have knowledge, but when you really start walking with God, you realize you really don't have knowledge, you just have information. You have a whole lot of he said, she said, you know. How do you really grasp, if, if the question is asked, how do you really know God exists? Basically, you only have information from what others say. And most people will say, well, you know, because I believe the Bible. You know what the Bible stands for? Let me educate you, Bishop. Bible, B-I-B-L-E. You know what that stands for? Basic information before leaving earth. You lie, that ain't what it stands for. That's Bible is not an acronym, it's a word. It does not have B period, I period. It's a word. It's the word of God. It's truth in it. Jesus say, lo, I come in the volume of the book. That means you have to believe what you read in the book. And how do you believe? Not by saying you believe. You believe by how you react to what you read. So if you believe the law, you have to act on the law of love. You have to demonstrate love. Not just talk about it. Demonstrate love. See, you can't get anything from God being spiritually, uh, what word I want to use? Uh, uh, help me out here. You know, when someone, what, what do they act? Well, how does that word I use? Uh, I can't think of it now, so I'm going to move on. That means the Holy Spirit didn't bring it back to my remembrance. We're not going to deal with it. Look at verse 13. Now it came, so now I guess I can get back focused. Arrogant. K 
can stand a spiritual, arrogant Christian. Can't stand that. What do I call that? Now I'm like Paul. Jesus didn't tell me that. I'm saying it. I have enough Jesus in me to see it. Those are the folks I just, you know, I look. If I'm going to reach to shake your hand, please don't shake my hand and go to jumping and, and twerking and moving around and speaking. and like I, That is crazy. We want to make ourselves so spiritual. But the Bible says, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says they have the zeal of God, but deny the power therein. See, we have too much of this faking, trying to, people trying to fake that they right there, Jesus right here, man, I don't have time for that. We have to, we have to watch it because we're representing heaven. We are like ambassadors. We represent heaven. We have to quit letting the enemy have his way with us. So Paul, now James talks about planning without God. In verse 13, he says, go to now, Ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get and gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. For that he ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live. And do this and do that. So some of y'all who've been wondering, why do people say that? It's Bible. You know how you say, well, you know, like if I say I'm going fishing tomorrow, I say, you know what, if, if the Lord's, if it's Lord's will, I'm going. Because the Bible tells us, he says, many are the plans of man, but it is God's plan that's going to oversee, that's going to take over, take control. So he said, in verse 15, this is what we ought to say. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You can't plan your life without God. You know? That's why when I go fishing, I say, God, I don't rely on skills. I say, God, if it's your will, let us catch some fish. And Shan, after a few hits, ain't no hits, I'm praying even harder. God, Jesus, you told Peter, cast on the right side of the boat, Lord. Just, Lord, 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 if I can just catch, if I can just catch a couple of them redfish, Lord, and a couple of this, and catch them, and then I go, oh, Lord, if I can just get some more, if I can get some more, then finally I have to tell myself, now you're being greedy. You ought to have enough by now. So, see, this is what we have to understand, if it's the Lord's will. But now, verse 16 says, you shall rejoice in your boasting. But now you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, the him that knoweth to do good and do it not, to him it is sin. Boasting in ourselves, planning without God, making this thing, you know, what are you going to do? I'm going to get up and go to work in the morning. I'm going to go make this paper. Ah, uh, you're planning without God. You know, oh, uh, I'm going to get up and go to work in the morning. How was your day? It wasn't a good one. You planned it without God. So what James is saying, come now or later, then draws attention to what follows. James wants, in verse 13, James wants to show that it is a bad mistake to plan our lives without God. The Jews traded wherever they, they went in the world. Some of them would travel for the purpose of trade. That's what they did. So as an example, James speaks about merchants who are in the church. And here are some merchants who are planning the trip. They say, we will go on the day that we decide. We will go to a certain city and stay there a year. We will trade there and we will make a profit, but God has no place in their plans. We plan everything but without God. Now, if you want to see people really plan with God, you let them take their first cruise like I did. I said, Lord, you know what? Need you to be with us on this. You start planning God in your plans. You start thinking about Titanic. You start thinking about ships sinking. You, you, you know, and, 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 and don't, and, and I, man, look, I couldn't sleep that night. First little wave I hear bump, I was up looking out the window. 
I said, Lord, give me a peace of mind <laughs> here. You know, and I can imagine what those people went through a week ago when water started coming through the walls. They probably thought it was another Titanic thing, but it was just a water pipe bust. So we have to plan God in everything. When you wake up in the morning, plan with God. When you send your children off to school, plan with God. We have to always plan it with God. Give God your plans and let him work your plans. And you'll realize, even with college children, I know I'm, I'm going to finish college in four years and I'm going to get this. You better plan it with God. I had a whole lot of laborers out there working under me that had college degrees, making $7 an hour digging with shovels. You have to plan it with God. Because you may get right through midways and God may give you that job without a degree. So you never know what's going to go on. Make sure God is included in your plans. Because when God has no place in your plans, James said that's horrible. Now these merchants think that they can do as they are planned, as they made their plans, they forgot God. It was as if the future was in their hands to control. But God alone knows the future, and it makes no sense to plan without God. Because we need him. It has to be with him. Planning for the future is good, but it must be with God. God plans is above all other plans. And his plans can never fail. That's why, again, he said, I think it's the book of Proverbs, say many are the plans of man. But it doesn't mean that it's going to work out. I, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay. Sister LeBlanc, you're a school teacher. I don't even know if they still do this. When you get your first class on the first day or the second day, do they still ask the children, AJ, Arstel, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do y'all still do that? In the lower grades. Y'all remember that in school when the teacher asked you, what do you want to be? So, Captain, what is it you wanted to be when you grow up? A nurse. A nurse. Who else raised their hands? What do you want to be when you grow up? Little, little Tiana, come here, little Tiana. What do you want to be? She's so nice in class. What do you want to be when you grow up? A what? Neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon. So, are you a neurosurgeon? No, but I'm in the medical field. Are you a nurse? I'm in the medical field. No, no, that ain't that. See, they won't answer. Are you or are you not a nurse? No. Let me ask again. Are you a registered nurse, RN? Are you an LVN? No. Are you a neurosurgeon? Not medical field. Are you a neurosurgeon? No. So you see what happened? We can plan life, but it may not turn out the way we want it. But it doesn't mean it's over. Now we can start now by saying, I have to include God in my plan. I'm not going to even try to remember because I can't remember what the heck I told the teacher. I don't remember her asking me what I wanted to be. And knowing me with myself, I probably looked and said, nothing. Because <laughs> first place, I didn't want to be there. Y'all know how it is in kindergarten. I wanted to be at home. I didn't want to play. I didn't want to laugh. I just stood in the corner and cried all day long. I was mad. I felt my mama abandoned me. You know. But as it got later, you know, and, and all children say this. What do you want to be? I want to be a police officer. You know. So the thing about it, we have to make our plans with God. We have to always say if it's God's will. So these merchants, verse 14, we almost done. These merchants cannot know what tomorrow will be like because only God knows what tomorrow is going to be like. That's why I love it when the scripture says, the day that God created, how did it go? Ah, one of my scriptures I love to quote is that um, rejoice in the day that God, because this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I like to say this, 
is that I wake up with no worries. Why? Because I plan my day in God and I think like this. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because God has already spoken to my tomorrow to accommodate me. So Lord, if it's thy will, I'm going to go fishing tomorrow and catch some fish. God has already spoken to my tomorrow to accommodate me. So you have to plan your day in God. God, if it's your will to get up in the morning to go to work, I want to be productive. Then you're planning in God. God has already spoken to your tomorrow. So these merchants thought, you know, hey, look, the merchants didn't know what tomorrow is going to be like. None of us know what tomorrow is going to be like. Uh, Deacon Stanley's in construction. Might say, look, we got, we, we have, we have 50 yards we're going to pull tomorrow. How, we, how I know it, we set the form and we measure it. We have 50 yards to pull tomorrow. But he still don't know what, he only know what he's going to do. But he don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. See, oh yeah, I do, yeah, I do, Bishop, because I watch the news and they say it's no rain. But the news didn't tell you that it was going to be a lockdown on the freeway from a deadly accident that all your concrete is held up now is hot and you can't pour. God can only see the unseen. We know what we plan. We know what our plans call for, but it's all about God. And then you wonder why would God let that happen and have to feed my family? You still going to get paid. Because you was at work. But what God saw was, is that if that concrete would have made it there, you really don't know your body is, is breaking down because you don't really feel the signs yet. And as soon as you begin to pull that mud out and make a couple of pulls straining to grade the concrete, your heart give out. So God say, I'm not going to let that happen. So I'm going to stop this concrete pour. See? Y'all ever heard, y'all done heard Elder Kenner's testimony where he said, I plan to go this way, but the Holy Spirit, let me see if I can get in this voice. I thank God, because Pastor Baines, I was going to drive that way. <laughs> see, Brother Kenner, you, 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 you got me down fact, I got you down fact too. But the Spirit of God told me, Hmm, you go that way. Go this way. But I decided I'm going to go that way anyway. <laughs> Got a ticket. I'm going to listen the next time. Am I right, Brother Kenneth? So we know God's plan. When God has a way to plan, he may say, I want you to go all the way around this way, but it's quicker that way, so I'm going to do it my way. Now you got a ticket or you have a flat. Or something went wrong. It's God. Y'all ever had that day when y'all say, man, I knew I should have listened to my... The old people say, listen to your first mind. I knew I should have listened to my first mind. It ain't that about that first mind. It's about listening to God. So James said they cannot see what would happen in the next year. Only God knows the future and it is in his control. They forget that they are human. As such, they cannot be sure of their own lives. And this human life lasts only for a short time. And the only certain thing is that at some time they will die. In the morning, the mist covers the country, but noon as it has all gone. Human life is like that. The use of the words mist expresses the thought that life is short. Human life on earth is like a mist or smoke. It has for a little while and then goes. That's what he talked about in verse 14 when he talked about the vapor. In verse 15 when he talks about, for that ye ought not to say. It is not that they should not plan. It is good to plan, but as they make plans, they need to know what God wants. So as you make your plans, ask God, God, what do you want in this day? You know, God may say, okay, you can proceed on with your plans. I'll make sure they'll go accordingly. But here's what I want you to do. When you, this person going to approach you, and this is how I want you to accept it. Find out what he wants. Remember I tell y'all about that little story about Queen Elizabeth and Sir Charles. Sir Charles was not an important man. Because he, 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 he worked for the king, they didn't, they, the queen, they didn't care. When he went into the lines, he had to stand in the line with everybody else. 
But one day something happened. The queen called him and said, come here, Charles. I need you to go and take care of my business. If anybody asks you any questions, you tell them the queen sent you. And don't worry about your business. I'm going to take care of your business. Now, Charles' business no longer had to stay at the end of the line. It had priorities, and the queen didn't have to go. She just sent it there and said, take care of it. Now, Charles walking around, he was unimportant, but now he's the most powerful man on the earth because he says, I represent the queen. And the queen said, think about us. When your business become more important than God, you are a failure. When your plans become more important than God's plan, you are a failure because it's not going to succeed. But when you put God's business above your business, his plans above your plans, everything that you have planned or thought of is going to be successful. That's biblical principle. You know, even Jesus said it. Jesus said, look, I must work the works of him that sent me. Even though I love you enough, don't want to leave. Father, look, remove this cup from me. But you know what? Wait a minute. Nevertheless, not as I will. Forget about my plans. That's my plans, but I want your plans. It's whatever your will is. See, the little boy that had the, 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 the five... What is it? Two loaves. I heard three fish. I heard two fish. Oh, Lord, we rewriting the scriptures. Oh, it was two fish and five loaves. Okay. Y'all going to believe Tiffany? She ain't looking in no Bible. She just said it was two fish. She did the same thing, y'all, that say three and five. Y'all really, y'all don't want to check that? Y'all sure y'all don't want to reference and check? How many of y'all believe this? Let me see the hands if you say it's two fish. Even Shirley said it was two. It was, how many of y'all believe? Where is it located at in the Bible? Oh, uh -huh, they said, wait, they look for them phones now. Let me, let me reference this. See? Uh-oh, say my phone's slow. I can't pull it up. What'd you say, Taylor? Kenneth, Matthew, what? Matthew, because sometimes I'll get up in there and say, turn to James chapter 10 and verse 49. People will start grabbing their Bibles and they think they say, wait a minute, Pastor, ain't no 49 chapters in the book of James. I said, well, open up your Bible then. <laughs> so where is it at now? Y'all still ain't found it? Matthew 24. Really? 24 and what? <laughs> uh-huh, see? See what I mean? That, that's why I tell y'all, you got to search. Because people will just call out anything. See how they brew the brother like, they want me to say, okay, that's it. But now we need to check it out because I'm watching y'all. Y'all don't even have a Bible open. Y'all twisting and playing with y'all hair. Matthew 24, because Paul Paul said it, and they tried to hear up and over talk him like they got it. I'm watching y'all. Y'all don't even have a Bible. Stand up. I bet the Bible don't even fall. Not even the dust of the Bible. Where is it? Who has it? 6 and 41, what it says? Five loaves and two fish, and it's probably in the other gospel too. Okay, so Tiffany is right. Two fish, five loaves. So now watch what Jesus did. Wasn't no food to feed the people. So they say, well, Lord, we don't have nothing. But there's a lad with two fish and five loaves, they didn't really believe that was enough because you had like a multitude of 5,000. And to make y'all understand, that wasn't the only miracle that Jesus did. It was also 4,000 that he did. It. So watch this here. He say, well, go get it. They went to the boy and they got it. Now his plan was, his parents' plan was to send him to go get two fish and five loaves. But they didn't know that God had a plan that superseded their plan. Now what if the mama would have told the boy, son, whatever you do, you hurry back home with those two fish and five loaves and don't you stop for nobody, don't you give nobody a piece of bread or nothing. But watch how God's plan changed. Jesus took the two fish and five loaves 
and he put it all together, fed everybody, and then told them to take up the fragments that was left. And they took up 12 baskets. So they had to help the lad take it home. Can you imagine what their parents said? What, 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 what? We only wanted two fish and five loaves. That could only feed just us. But you got 12, 12 baskets. Where did they come from? The only story he can say was Jesus took it and put it together. And mom, dad, he fed 5,000 people. And look what we got left, 12 baskets. Uh-huh. Men. Well, I knew somebody was going to catch that. And, and the reason why I don't like to count the children, because what do the scriptures say? Do the scriptures say it was others there? Not including the women and the children. So we can say over. Whatever it was, it was a miracle. So you see what I'm, I'm getting at? If you give God your plans, he will multiply whatever you're trying to do. That means you put God's business first. You know what God even said? I'll show you a principle, he said. He said, okay, look, I'm sick of y'all. He didn't say it like that. God, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna put words in God's mouth. But he said, look, look at my house. That's what he was telling me in the Bible. He said, my house is just, look how it look. Falling apart, but your houses look good. God was not pleased with that. But when we put him first, and put his business first, man, God can take the little plan that we have and he can make it so successful. Look what he told Joshua in Joshua 1 and 6. He said, let not the book of, this book of law depart from your mouth. Do according to what everything it says. And then, and only then, shall thy way be prosperous and thou shalt be successful. So it's all about putting God first. See? My plan was to retire at 50 with good benefits. But God's plan, I've always said, God, whatever your will is, let it be. It was God's will for me to come off the job at 48. You know, my plan was to retire. Brother Ike, I had perfect attendance for about 15, 20 years. Did, never missed a day. I was there every day. I was at 28 years, so I had 27 years of perfect attendance. And I was planning. I say, this is my retirement money. And I had 720 hours of vacation time. And then I had some stocks and bonds I was investing in. I say, this is, this is my, my retirement money. This is going to get me my Bentley. 50 years old, I'm going to have it. Well, God said, I want you to come off the job. And when I quit the job, there was no income coming from the job. I said, well, I'll fix this. I'll apply for my, for my uh, what they call that, my uh, unemployment. They turned it down. So all of that money I planned for a Bentley, it had to go towards bills. I said, that's okay. That's all right. I'm still happy. I'm satisfied. But see, when you put God's business first, it still come to you in a better way, in a better way. That's why you have to put God first. I'm telling you all, I'm not trying to make y'all feel good. Paul said we have to be examples to the flock. I'm telling you all, when you put God's business first, see a lot of people got their business first and got God way out of the equation. And what they think ain't gonna happen ain't gonna happen because some of them ain't gonna live to enjoy. Or some of them gonna get it to a certain age and their children gonna take it. That's why I'm trying to spend every nickel. Nah, I'm just. So let, 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 let me finish this up because they already did the offering. So that means my time is gone. So, but as they make plans, they need to know what God wants. They should accept that God alone knows what would happen. The only way to plan for the future is to trust God. They should not uh, say that uh, they will do what they're going to do. Instead, they should say, we will do it if God allows it to happen. Let me close out verse 16 to 17. The proud merchants were sure of themselves. 
They were sure that by their own efforts they would succeed. They planned and act if God did not exist. It was as if they claimed to be able to control the future. And they were wrong. And, a, and, and, and confidence in themselves like that is evil. So to think that they could plan the future is to sin against God because only God can know what is to come. Only God. Sin, when he talks in verse 17, is not just to do wrong things, but also the failure to do right things. So think about a person who knows to do right. He sins if he does not do it. And oftentimes we sin because we make our plans without God. You know? And we make those plans because we want to be accepted. We want everybody to like us. You're wasting your time. Because I don't care how much a person say they like you, you make them mad one time. And you're going to find out not everything they liked about you, you're going to find out everything they dislike about you. But we have to understand, people, when you make your plans, make them with God. Because only God knows what the future holds. God knows what tomorrow is going to be. And God knows everything, every detail. You know? And I use fishing as a light point. When I go fishing, I just go because I like to go fishing. But I know if God don't speak to the fish, I'm not going to catch anything. And maybe if it's God's will that he don't want me to catch anything, I'm good with that. Maybe he just wanted me out there to get a relax of a mind. Or maybe he want to show me something to teach. God has a way of teaching us stuff in the very things that we don't see. Just yesterday, I was telling my wife, no, it was today. I was just sitting there, and I happened to look out the window. And, and we see things, but we never think about nothing. And I just happened to see this bird flying and stop. And at that moment, Deacon Stanley, there were like a peace that came over me. Like I had, for that second, I had not a worry in the world. And I told the wife, and I just kept looking at him, and I, I told the wife, I said, you know, it is so beautiful being a bird. So I said, because a bird is just so free. They just fly wherever they want to fly. In whatever tree they want to fly. As high as they want to fly, and as low as they want to fly. And I said, just, just looking at him, just, and, and the bird was just sitting on the ledge. And he was just sitting there, just, just flapping his wings. Just, and I was like, that is so beautiful. And then I thought about, God gives us an answer to everything. Spirit of God brought to my remembrance. Consider the fowls of the air. They don't labor for nothing, but yet God still provide for them. So the message that God wanted me to have is that don't worry about anything, son. I'm providing for everything. Jesus came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. What do you mean? Be like the bird. Just be free. Be free. Be free. Birds don't worry. They don't have to worry about what they're going to eat. Why? God already planted all the insects is there. And that's what God wants us to do is just live life to the fullness of being happy. Put his plans first. Always remember to say, if it's God's will. For the singers, never say I'm attempt to sing this song. Say, if it's God's will, I'm going to sing this song. And if it don't come out right, then you know it wasn't God's will. <laughs> Make sense? It's all about God. It's when you start living for God, putting everything about God first before everything you do. Everything. Because the Bible does not lie. Psalms 1 says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the God. Now, most people is doing what they're doing, but they're struggling. Most people are doing what they're doing, and they hate it. But see, when you give your plans to God, you know, you might say, you know, I'm just going to use date, not saying it's her. She might say, you know, oh, I'm working at this school. I hate being a teacher. Well, you should have put God plans first because God might wanted you to be 
administrative. He might want you to work in a law office or a court office. You know, you got to put God's plan first. When you plan to put God first, things will change. Stand to your feet all over the building. You have to plan it with God. When you plan it with God, it always works out. I'm telling you all. My goodness, I'm telling you. That's all I can tell you all. God has amazing ways of taking care of things that he needs to take care of. It. You know, he has amazing ways how he do things. And I teach pastors that often I tell them, you shouldn't be worried about what the ministry have and what it don't have. If you worry, it's because you're not putting God first. Because God want anything you need for ministry. Don't depend on the people. It's God's ministry. God will provide it. If you trust him, he'll provide it. And you won't have to be up there in the pulpit. Ah, uh, you're driving new cars, but you can't give, or you want to give a dollar to them. You won't have to do all that. That's stupidity. But if you trust God, and I teach them this, I, when I go to God, I say, God, this is your ministry. First of all, thank you for entrusting it with me and hope I don't do such a bad job that you kick me out when it's time to get in heaven. But God, I'll do it according to your will and your standards. So, Father, listen, you say whatever I need in your ministry to operate, God, well, this is what I need. And I used those same principles when I was working in the secular world, when we would go into our meetings with, with management and everybody sit there and playing games and joking and laughing and they come around the table, you have something, no sir, you have something, no sir. When you get to me, yes sir, listen, I have these three labors, okay? I need this one promoted to this position, this one promoted to this position, this, and this is the reason why, because this person is doing and explain it and all that, and they all look at me and twerk their noses at me and talk about me and all of that, but guess what happened? Everything I asked for, I got it. And then you know what the word was? Y'all need to sit down with him because he write up his paperwork and everything. We have no questions. So you're only going to get what you ask. You got to put God first. You have to represent God in everything that you do. Even on your jobs, he said you represent him. If you got an evil master, he say that you still represent God. You represent God. And when you put God's plan, I'm telling you all, it'll be there. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Teach us, God. Oh, God, keep teaching us by your spirit that dwells in us how to not only think like Jesus, but how to live like Jesus, how to live like your children, raw children in your kingdom, God. Teach us, God, so we'll be a beacon light to this world, Father. Father, we thank you tonight, God. Heal our bodies from unseen uh, diseases and sickness, Father. Deliver us, Father. Help us, Lord. Sanctify your word that is in us, Lord. Renew the spirit of our minds, Father, that we will no longer think corrupt or think like the world, but Lord, but we want to think like you as we keep our minds and our focus on heavenly things. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.